Welcome to the last session of the, of the workshop. Um, our, our anchor speaker is uh, Laura Bolzano. Headliner. Headliner, yes. <laughs> Great. OK, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I wanted to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I was pleased to be invited. I predicted that I would learn a lot, and my prediction was right. It's been a really uh, informative and interesting week. Um, so, uh, like some other speakers have said today in some previous days, what I do is a little bit different than maybe the main theme of this workshop, uh, but it has lots of similar flavors. Uh, I work in uh, model estimation and, and uh, exploring the app applicability of models to different kinds of data sets um, and, and building algorithms that do that model estimation efficiently or in uh, the presence of some real world problems like missing data and things like that. And so today I'm going to tell you about a particular type of model, which you may be familiar with, called the subspace clustering model and an algorithm to, um, to estimate that model. So, this uh, work is joint with uh, my uh, past PhD student, John Lepore, who's now a professor in ECE at, at Portland State University. He you know, developed the algorithm and, and worked with me on it uh, in the first place. And when we saw its uh, excellent performance and potential for theoretical uh, developments, we also enlisted the help of David Hong, who's another PhD student at Michigan graduating this year, and Yan Shotan, who was a PhD student with Roman Vershinin, but is now a postdoc here at Berkeley. So if you have any questions, um, you could ask any one of us for. OK. So um, let me first tell, excuse me, tell you what the subspace clustering model is and motivate it with an example. So uh, here's a data matrix. It's a matrix of gene expressions from different uh, knockout experiments. And uh, just like we've seen many people talk about in talks so far, uh, uh, this matrix is low rank. And maybe we can leverage that structure for a variety of reasons. Uh, maybe we don't have to take all of the measurements. We could interpolate measurements. We could identify outliers, things like that. Okay? But actually, it turns out that this matrix has another interesting structure. If you were to take the columns and cluster them in some way, then each one of those clusters itself is also low rank. And not just the same rank, but a smaller rank. And uh, you know, in this case, uh, the original matrix was about rank 61 with a very nice gap, you can see. Um, and these also have nice gaps, but the maximum rank of the submatrix is 25. Okay? So in fact, if you add these up, you'll conclude that these each are linearly independent subspaces that we can use in order to uh, model these data. Okay? So this is an interesting model, first of all, because uh, often when we can cluster data this way, we believe there's some meaningful reason. You know, These experiments are all very similar. They have some similar consequence. Uh, we have some reason to think that we want to cluster them and then maybe do some low dimensional modeling. But not only that, we can also think about this uh, model as being itself more parsimonious. So, you know, imagine we had these three uh, clusters in, in, a, in a data set. Uh, then we could model it as one uh, rank three subspace, or as uh, these three subspaces, a plane and two lines. And in fact, if uh, we used the plane and two lines, uh, we would have a better opportunity of finding outliers that were also in this subspace or perhaps interpolating missing data. Obviously not just in three dimensions, but if we had something much higher dimensional. Okay? So uh, that's in fact the reason why this model is applied in, in a variety of contexts from genomics, which I mentioned, to computer vision in problems like um, face and object identification in problems in computer vision of uh, uh, object tracking or uh, motion through of objects through uh, video and uh, in problems of computer network uh, topology identification where you have, let's say, hop passively monitored hop count data from different IP addresses and you'd like to cluster them and, and interpolate data. 
So uh, that's the subspace clustering model and uh, the reason why uh, we're interested in it. Uh, and just to, to repeat, uh, it's important that our context is we have meaningful groups without labels, so we have to do something unsupervised to identify them. But uh, the reason why I stress that we have meaningful groups is because we can still evaluate at the end of the day based on our grouping, right? It's not that we just have an objective function, uh, but actually we want to see that our final clusters have some meaning. Okay, and then uh, we assume each cluster itself has some geometric structure, in this case, a low rank structure. So there's quite a bit of work in this area starting 20 years ago, uh, but really uh, picking up in the last 10 years. There are convex formulations, uh, proofs of uh, correct clustering, uh, you know, many non-convex alternating algorithms, very similar to the one I'm going to tell you about. Uh, they work with compressed data and noisy data and outliers. There's a very, very uh, vast amount of literature. Um, but what we were interested in is uh, uh, building an algorithm based on one which is uh, which is basically a very interesting and fundamental objective, uh, which is the K-subspace clustering objective. And we were hoping, because this is sort of a very natural thing that people think to do, uh, which I'll, I'll get to in just a second, uh, to try to understand it better. Um, and then, uh, if we're lucky, you know, try to improve it in some way that, that gets better performance than uh, other uh, convex formulations that are unrelated, or we, we don't know yet if they're related to this objective, okay? So the K subspace clustering objective is just a generalization of K means to the situation where our center points in the clusters are not, or centers are not points, but are planes, okay? Uh, so we just have a K means cost function with data points X, uh, clusters denoted by C, and then subspace bases denoted by this uh, U sub K, okay? And we take the distance from X to the nearest point in the subspace that it's been assigned to. Uh, and you could think of that just as a projection onto the center, just the way that K means is, okay? Okay, so uh, here we have then a generalization of the k-means objective. Their results a natural uh, alternating algorithm equivalent to the k-means algorithm. This was first derived and presented uh, about 20 years ago. And um, the algorithm is very natural. We need to know the number of clusters and the rank of each subspace. Uh, we start with some initialization of subspaces here and then we alternate. We assign our clusters according to projection, whichever subspace is closest, you go in that cluster. And then uh, we find the best rank our subspace from that cluster of data and repeat, okay? Uh, very simple, very natural algorithm, okay? Now, like k-means, this algorithm suffers from poor initialization and other issues. Uh, but really, in k subspaces, it's much worse than in k means. You know, uh, in k means, uh, it's not that hard to find. Maybe if you run several initializations to find a good one. But in k subspaces, most of the initializations are actually bad initializations. Okay. So uh, here's just one example. I have uh, 400 data points in four clusters, equally balanced. And this matrix here is an n by n matrix, which should be the co-association matrix. So we're expecting to get a block diagonal matrix here if we did the right thing, okay? It's one yellow if I clustered those points together and blue zero if I uh, didn't cluster them together, okay? So this is from a random initialization and we could see that it's a mess and it's not very good and this isn't abnormal for K subspaces. But uh, though we see it looks kind of like a mess, we also see it doesn't look uh, you know, completely unsalvageable. There's still some block uh, behavior. And in fact, it kind of looks like maybe these two clusters have been sort of mixed together in a way that we wouldn't want. And then you know, these two clusters have sort of been mixed together. Okay. 
And that's actually uh, uh, something that uh, then we could leverage. So if each uh, k subspace output is uh, you know, not great but not too bad, we could think of it as a weak cluster in analogy to um, ensemble learning in, in classification, uh, and then try to use many weak clusters together in order to get a good clustering output. So in fact, if we uh, just do uh, five of these random k subspaces initializations, we can see something uh, much better. And, and with 50, we can drive the clustering error down to just 2% from 50% in the initial um, clustering. Okay. So um, that was the idea that we had. Uh, we, so, so we, yeah. you initialize it randomly. randomly. Exactly. And then you run the subspace version of k-means, and you get something. And then you do that 10 times or whatever, and then you're doing the averaging. Exactly. So, And what I'm averaging is this matrix, which is one where I put the two points together and zero otherwise. So it's like a co-association matrix, and then I'm averaging it for some kind of affinity. So is there any, any is, for each time you run and to try and get a clustering, any notion of either a threshold where it does not well, not well, and then if you run long enough, it gets sort of much better sort of quickly. Um, or, sorry, or, say it again. A threshold over time, you mean? Yeah. So in iterations? This, for each initial condition, I run a certain yeah. number of steps, um, and you know, then I feed that into my ensemble or whatever. So right, right. Steps. Do you see that it, you know, it gets sort of better gradually or not, yeah. not well at all? No, that's a, good, that's a good question. First, First, let me just say that so we don't like pick a number of steps. Uh, the the while loop keeps going until nothing changes. Okay, um, and I'll tell you later that this uh, this always decreases the objective or it stays the same. So we can uh, count on that happening. I mean, uh, but secondly, each step, right? say it again. You can evaluate solution quality at each step. Yeah. The, the uh, so. So it depends on what you mean by solution quality. So when I say solution quality, I think of the objective, right? Because I don't have any labels. Uh, so if I evaluate the objective, then that is uh, what's decreasing here. Um, but if you have some side information or something, yeah, there's a different thing I guess you could do. For that objective, is, does it get better sort of gradually, do you know? Gradually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, I don't have those plots in here, unfortunately, but I have some, uh, and it's generally gradual, and then it it stops, and when you know it looks like something like this, it actually uh, is at a place where it will not improve. Um, does that help? And if you start with one of them, if you had labels or some, you knew the truth, and you started with that, does the other, you're iterating back and forth on two matrices, right? Is that the case, or...? Um, oh, so you mean like if k equals 2 and I have one subspace, but um, I don't have the other? A warm start. How, how does it behave if you have a warm start in some sense? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we actually uh, tried that. So let's see. Let me, let me think back. So, so we basically ran some k subspaces and like took this as the output uh, and tried to... Oh, but we, we did something different because, because if this is the... Like this is a local minimum in the sense that there is no change that uh, would be gotten by this algorithm to give a change in the objective. So actually, it would it would stop here. Um, but maybe we could talk about it offline because we've tried a lot of different things, and I'm sure one of them is what you're talking about. So you know the number capital K of subspaces ahead. Yes. Yes. All of them have the same rank R. Uh, that's what we're assuming for sort of simplicity right now. When they don't have the same rank, it can be difficult. Uh, you basically yeah, upper bound it. Example, right? they had different ranks, like yeah. 25, and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. So you would use 25 in that case. Okay. All right. So uh, this then uh, inspired our algorithm, which I, I don't need to say because it's sort of clear what we're trying to do, but I'll say it briefly. Uh, we have uh, now just some distribution, say like the Haar measure on the Grassmannian from which we draw subspaces, and then some, uh, some base, number of base clusterings, capital B. And we'll run K subspaces, capital B times, potentially in parallel. Uh, we'll get the co-clustering matrix and average those for some affinity matrix. 
Um, we also, we have another parameter Q. We, we threshold that affinity matrix and then we run spectral clustering. Okay. So this is the algorithm that I'll be talking about and, and trying to say some things about. Okay, so before I, I tell you a little bit about the theory, I just wanted to show you one set of the results. So the reason why we were really excited and wanted to explore the theory of this uh, algorithm um, was because its uh, clustering results were, were definitely state of the art. So I can't tell if it's visible to you, but some of these entries are bolded and uh, across the board, our algorithm is in the top three of all the algorithms. And when we've tried new data sets to uh, we get a similar type of performance. So it works very well, uh, uh, even though it's really quite a very simple algorithm. Okay, so let me tell you what we know, uh, you know, starting with what we know about K subspaces, the space algorithm that doesn't do any averaging over the affinity matrices, okay? So first, um, it's pretty easy to see that since I wrote the objective function, similar to k-means, there will be some hardness results. Of course, these are in worst case, right? Uh, uh, worst case instances exist so that this is true. Uh, but if we fix the rank even uh, to one, then uh, this objective, uh, it's NP hard to approximate the objective within some epsilon. There exists some epsilon, maybe it's small, but we can't approximate smaller than that, okay? And this is just gotten by a reduction to k-means, so that has a similar result. Uh, another one that's a little more interesting uh, is that if we instead uh, fix the number of clusters to two but let the rank be input to the problem, uh, it turns out it's NP-hard to approximate within any factor, okay? So we prove this by uh, proving that in this case, uh, it's NP hard to decide whether the objective is zero. Okay. So um, in some sense, maybe the K subspaces problem is harder than the K means problem. Of course, like I said, this is worst case, but it kind of motivates the fact that all the results in subspace clustering assume a generative model of the data that they're trying to cluster in order to prove something about their algorithm. So we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna assume our data are coming from some underlying union of subspaces. Question, how, how about by criteria for some, some kinds of by criteria? Sorry, I'm, I'm not so familiar. So, do, so, is it related so to three this? Cluster, three, you know, K equals three that does as well as K equals two. Does, um, you know, within some factor of the best that could be done for k equals two. Oh, or, I see. Or something like that. Uh, yeah, so meaning that if you, uh, you ran it for a different set of parameters, but you could still be within some error on a different yeah, could, set. Could you, get, you know, you know with, with, is it also NP hard to, to make a guarantee like that? Right. That's a good question. I don't know the answer. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Did you say that you can't approximate it to any factor? Yes. So that's because it's NP hard even to decide whether it's zero. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Uh, this was my uh, foray into this uh, field uh, with a uh, colleague in computer science. So I'd love to know the kinds of questions that people would ask about this. Okay, so uh, uh, like I said, that kind of motivates the fact that we're gonna use uh, generative models to, to make uh, theoretical statements about our algorithm. Now, what was also known about the K subspaces algorithm before now, initially, actually, uh, is like I said, uh, the objective function decreases at every iteration uh, and it reaches a local optimum in the sense that uh, you can't you know, move a cluster point to a different cluster, move a point to a different cluster or reestimate subspaces and have a better objective. Um, and there's a set of initializations of non-zero measure, and in some cases, most of the space, uh, the initializations lead to a bad local minimizer, okay, or not the global minimizer. Okay, so let's uh, just get some intuition of what we see happening from a random initialization, okay? So I have a, a 500 by 1,000 uh, size data matrix, and I'm going to uh, vary the rank and the number of subspaces 
and the affinity between the subspaces in the, in the true union, the underlying true union, uh, and see basically what happens when I run K subspaces. Uh, in this case, I I've, I've have uh, the number of subspaces exactly equal to five, but I'm increasing the rank from left to right. And the affinity is uh, increasing along the y-axis. So, um, you know, the subspaces are very close together at the top of these plots. And what you see on each row uh, is a histogram over 100 runs of what the misclustering error was from the k-subspaces algorithm. Okay, so like uh, this row right here, uh, the affinity is about a half, and uh, it basically does like 50% per, uh, percent of the runs had a 40% error, and the other half had a 60% error. Okay, so that's what this means. In this case here, for example, it just always got it right. It, 100 times it had a zero error. Okay. So what I uh, want you, know, you to notice from these plots uh, is that there's a real discretization of the possible clustering errors you can get. In this case, for example, you can get 20%, 40%, 60%, or 80%. So basically what K subspaces is doing is mixing up two of the clusters or three of the clusters or mixing pairs uh, in four of the clusters, okay? So you don't see something where it's just drawing many points from many subspaces. Uh, you see this kind of, uh, you know, error that's structured, okay? And uh, it, you know, holds true in, uh, as the rank increases, though, when you get a high enough dimension, it basically has enough space and the K subspaces can overcome it. So now these plots, k is uh, decreasing, 2 on the top, 5 on the bottom, and you can see the pattern that I've mentioned again. So when it's, there's 2, we always get 50% error. Uh, when there's 3, we get a third and 2 thirds and so on. Okay. So this really uh, you know, uh, motivates us, gives us a feeling that maybe we're right about each one of these K subspaces initializations being a weak cluster, right? It gives us some partial information, even though the resulting clustering isn't great. Okay, so then what can we say about it? This is just an overview. I'll say things briefly, and then I'll, I'll try to go a little bit into each one. So um, first, we understand that uh, just from a random initialization, uh, it clusters a pair of points with probability monotonic in their absolute inner product, okay? So the closer two points are together in the data set, the more likely they are to be co-clustered. That makes sense, uh, but we know it, understand it in a, in a more precise way. Um, so recognizing that, we uh, looked to uh, another algorithm called thresholded subspace clustering, which builds an affinity matrix exactly based on the gram matrix, so on the, the pairwise inner products. Um, and so we generalized their theory to say uh, for any algorithm that builds an affinity matrix whose ijth entry is uh, the inner product of the i and j data points in the data set, uh, uh, potentially changed by some monotonic transformation and perturbed by some bounded perturbation, uh, we can still have good clustering, okay? So this model then generalizes any, uh, any situation where we may not have access to inner products, but we can only get some monotonic fun function of them approximately, okay? So say you have missing data, compressed data, data with outliers and noise, you don't have access directly to these inner products, but you have access to a monotonic function of them, at least in expectation, okay? So we have that more general theory, and then we prove that our ensemble case subspaces algorithm has uh, this uh, some monotonic function of the absolute inner products as the expectation for the random affinity matrix that we get, okay? So then, of course, if we can bound uh, the deviation, meaning we can show this concentrates, then we can show that it works in a variety of cases, okay? And uh, I, I have a star here, so we didn't actually do this for the alternating algorithm, only just an algorithm which says take a random initialization, cluster, and stop, okay? 
Okay, so I don't know exactly when I started, but uh, five, more five more minutes, okay. So um, I'm just going to uh, maybe tell you about the first simple results and then the, the last theorem. So um, like I said here, random initializations cluster a pair of points uh, in a monotonic function of their inner product. So we were sort of exactly asking that question at the beginning. How can we characterize the probability that two points, x and y, in our data set are clustered together, either both clustered to this subspace y, or if you flip them, both clustered to a subspace v, right? Uh, and before we solved that, we looked at an even simpler problem where those two uh, subspace candidates are one-dimensional, okay? And uh, then it becomes quite easy to see that it'll be a function only of the inner product between the vectors x and y. This is two dimensions, uh, and it's obvious there, but this holds also for d dimensions, okay? So if x and y are very close together, then a random subspace, uh, two random subspaces placed in the circle, one will be close to both of them. Uh, if they're orthogonal, then it'll have a 50% chance uh, that you'll be assigned to the same subspace. Okay, and we can say that precisely, uh, that uh, as the angle between them increases, the probability of co-clustering decreases, and it's a function of theta, okay? So in general, uh, we know uh, this is also true not just for one-dimensional subspaces, but we only know that it is a monotonic function, not a particular monotonic function, okay? Okay, so uh, like I mentioned then, uh, given that, if we can generalize uh, a model which uh, says given these type of measurements, we can do clustering, then uh, we have uh, solved our problem. And so um, we, uh, we do that. I'm not going to share those results here. Uh, but we basically uh, talk about then all the algorithmic results in terms of this quantity that's called the angular separation. So uh, we call it uh, 5q. And uh, basically, it'll take uh, over all data points in all subspaces, a data point in some subspace, and look at its inner products with other points in its own subspace, okay? And the qth such inner product should have absolute value larger than the inner product with that point to any other point in any other subspace, okay? So, you know, when I say it like this, it's very clear that if we do that and we look at inner products or a monotonic function of them, when I threshold at Q, then I'm going to have a, a graph that I can cluster, right? Okay, so uh, uh, we basically then prove that, um, like I said earlier, our EKSS0 function has uh, this some monotonic function of the absolute inner products as its expectation. And then uh, the work is to prove that there's some concentration uh, that gives a deviation tau, which is strictly bounded below this angular separation. Okay, so if the deviation is below phi of q, which is why there's over two, uh, then we can guarantee that the thresholded affinity matrix will give correct clustering. Okay. And we've done that in the paper with different assumptions on subspaces, uh, missing data models, noise models, and things like that. Okay, so here's uh, one of those uh, results just to give you the flavor. We have some subspaces and our points are drawn from those subspaces uniformly from the unit sphere. So we have a very nice data distribution. Um, then if Q is basically large enough, uh, and the affinity between every pair of subspaces is bounded, then we get a correct clustering from the algorithm with high probability. The only part of this result that's different from other results in the area is this term right here that has a probability that depends on the number of clusterings we use. Uh, and the good thing is that essentially, uh, if we can control this thing gamma, uh, then you know, if gamma gets small, we can crank up on B and we can still make sure this probability goes down. Okay, uh, so um, 
These are other algorithms. If anyone's interested in them, I won't talk about them today since I'm out of time. Uh, SSC, or sparse subspace clustering, is one of the, the strongest ones in terms of both theory and practice so far. And we see that EKSS uh, beats it uh, pretty regularly. Here, in terms of the angle between subspaces, uh, EKSS can improve over SSC in terms of error. Uh, I just want to point out that EKSS0 only behaves as well as thresholded subspace clustering. It makes sense because it just uses inner products. So really, doing this alternating stuff is helping a lot, uh, but we still can't prove anything about that. So. OK, and then uh, just to show uh, these results again, uh, I want to stress that uh, you know, the algorithm really works nicely across the board. It's not the best in every column by any means, uh, but it's in the top three, and, and all the other algorithms aren't uh, in the top five. You know? So we see that when we apply it to new data sets, it, it is a really strong method, even though it's quite simple, just a few lines of code. OK, so uh, in summary, uh, if you're interested, the paper is on archive. Um, you know, we have this, this pretty simple algorithm with very nice guarantees. Uh, and like I said, performance that really exceeds those guarantees. Uh, and along those lines, the really open work that we're doing going forward is to try to answer that question. How can we prove that the performance should uh, be better, especially, say, in a context where the subspaces, the true data, are, are highly aligned. So um, with that, I thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. Yeah. So Luther Shulman has some well-known work on um, more effective ways to seed k-means so that okay. it's um, guaranteed to produce some reasonable results. There's also some other work called k-means++. Plus plus yeah, no, there's a... Are there analogs of this in the subspace setting? So people have tried, and uh, like uh, some of these algorithms have baked in, like the median k-flats has baked into it. They try to do a better type of initialization that's sort of analogous to um, farthest insertion. Um, and, and yeah, other people have tried. And they see things that work better, but it's all heuristic, and people haven't been able to say things about it. I mean, I guess one of the appeals of uh, some of this uh, theoretical work on ordinary k-means is that there are uh, some rigorous outcomes. Uh, right. Uh, but I also don't know whether um, the empirical performance um, reflects um, that theory. Right. Yeah. I don't know either. So. But you know, k subspaces seems interesting and related. And actually, since I've been thinking about it, which is uh, six years ago, I, I tried to come up with more ways to t make ties between those two and um, have only really scratched the surface. Okay. Uh, thank you, Laura. Thank you. Uh, can you say the benediction? Or, uh, no, I <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll say a benediction, but I had to run out to meet someone. But, um, well, okay. <laughs> benediction. <laughs> so um, were we just concluding, or um, so so we're concluding. We're concluding. At a minimum, we should thank um, all the organizers for the work they did, which is major concentrated. On <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And thanks to the speakers and the thanks attendees the speakers, yeah. for, and a, for, for a nice conference. Yeah. Yeah. There's been a few occasions of these. So especially if you're on the younger side of the room, who's going to organize the next one? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Thanks.